So uh, from now on, uh, in, a, in this roundtable session, the moderator, uh, Ms. Matsunaga, and me ask to a question uh, to a presenter. So that presenter should answer the first, please. And for regarding these issues, topics, uh, other two presenters, uh, if you have any additional comments, ideas, or information, uh, please comment. And also to, to audience, uh, if you have a questions uh, in the chat box, uh, I have a questions. Uh, please write down, I have questions. So sometimes uh, I pick up uh, some of you uh, to ask a question in my oral. So you, ha you can use uh, both, uh, either in English or Japanese. Uh, don't worry too much. So, okay, so Mr. Na Mr. Mr. Na Naka uh, Matsunaga, uh, do you have any questions to present us? Okay, um, the first of all, I'd like to ask about, um, um, so that um, you mentioned uh, the Peter priest. Um, I back to that uh, liberalism you mentioned. Um, COVID-19 reveals uh, deficiencies in liberalism, you told us. And um, I think that the uh, um, German sociologist, Tennis, suggested uh, two types of social groupings, uh, which is a German, Germany, uh, Gemeinschaft, often translated as community, and Gesellschaft, or society. I think we Japanese live in a Gemeinschaft. We tend to worry about other people's opinions rather than respecting individual freedom. Yeah, it's not a question, but uh, it's experiencing um, uh, our civility. <laughs> and the question is, um, Peter has organized um, various awards and one of them uh, is the biannual um, International Highlight Award. So um, giving that post-corona um, focus will shift to promote buildings are more conscious of people's health and social needs as well as sustainability. So with the selection criteria for winning top ranked building change to reflect this, Peter? Yes. Um <clears throat> The building that won was the Torah Nornen in the Stockholm by OMA. Uh, two towers, two residential towers with a few amenities in the uh, lower floors. And we were able to travel there in September when the numbers in Germany and in Sweden were low. So we used the little time piece uh, to travel there and visit them ourselves. And we discussed with the people that lived there. Uh, the most interesting part was that every apartment has their own terrace. Uh, some of them have two little terraces and <clears throat> people that lived there said they had to go to uh, work uh, remote from their companies for three months, uh, which they could very well do in that building because they had a little piece of terrace, everyone, and they were able to put off, uh, let's say, a little even smaller workspace at the terrace so they said they were quite happy to be in that building at that time um, because it worked for them very well the most important for us to see was that the local politics had a rule that you could not buy an apartment um, for just the reason to put your money somewhere so this is not a speculative tower it is forbidden to speculate with apartments in Sweden. Um, if you want, you can buy one and you have to live in it, which means that these two towers have a few hundred uh, units of really people living there and no investors from anywhere, from abroad, which is really good for the uh, social uh, surrounding, for the context, for the city, um, because empty towers like you experience in London or in New York or in other or in Chinese places, empty towers are the worst because they hurt the city, they hurt the surrounding, they hurt local commerce. And this was very 
helpful to see such a building by Ohm A, which is kind of an, a very interesting sculptural building as well. So we loved it and we, uh, we thought it was the right answer for these times to have such a building. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I understand that. Well, we, there are lots of empty towers in Japan, actually, especially the countryside. It's really sad. Thank you. Yes, we have that here too. Mm -hmm. So anyone, other questions? Yes, uh, can, I, can I ask something in that context? Uh, does Sweden uh, or maybe also Japan um, react on Airbnb and the possibility of like short time renting versus long time renting uh, yeah, in this context? Do you know anything about that, Peter? I don't know about, of course, Japan, but uh, looking that the whole world has a lot less of international travel means that all the Airbnb apartment holders worldwide have a very big problem because their mode of making money is, of course, vastly reduced. Many have given up um, and have uh, said, well, I earned for a few years quite well. Now there's no more chance there will be no tourism for a year. So they gave up on the Airbnb model and rented the apartment um, to someone local for less money, but at least income. So I know that uh, Airbnb has gone down on one hand. On the other hand, people were looking for remote offices in interesting places. So I have friends that live in Jakarta that uh, have, been to, have gone to, to Bali and they have stayed in Bali since March now um, with their kids remote schooling with uh, good techno technology at their international school in Jakarta. They're working remote and then they said, well, instead of living in congested and polluted Jakarta, why don't we just stay in Bali? So they have moved there and lived there for six, seven months. And this is what mm -hmm. many people do within the country or let's say within Europe. I know people that have gone to Portugal and stayed in Portugal now for a few months working remote. So um, you can do that with an Airbnb apartment. You can talk to the people and say, uh, may I live there for three months? We agree on a different rate and not the daily rate. So you have mm -hmm. both people looking for interesting places nowadays to work remote for a long time and they are uh, willing to pay and the tourism resorts have a problem with no tourists so mm -hmm. might as well have remote workers at their place mm -hmm. uh, this is happening all over asia i think um uh, thailand and so on uh, they're looking for new revenues so maybe these right, remote yeah. workers could be interesting if they have digital right, infrastructure yeah. Right, yes, yeah. Yeah, very good, like yeah. The, the colleague is saying from New Zealand, um, yes, uh, New Zealand has no Europeans coming. Right, yeah. Um, you have Australians maybe coming now, maybe, I don't know. Uh, not, not yet, now we are, nobody can come in, nobody come out. But the interesting part in New Zealand is that now everybody makes holiday within New Zealand. So yeah. what was earlier spent abroad is now spent in the money. And there the economy within New Zealand is actually very booming because all the money is there. And uh, also people who, the whole tourist industry is not suffering because people are here and they wanna do things. So it's actually very interesting now inward looking. And uh, the, the problem is more, the import of things because the shipment and, and airplanes don't fly to import goods, which uh, the country is, is depending on from outside. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I ask a question to Mark? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. And uh, uh, recently, I feel that the focus on the architecture and the buildings is becoming more and more influenced by SNS, social network, networking services, uh, yeah. like uh, Facebook or Twitter or the Instagrams and so on. And uh, XR, uh, VR, AR, ML, 
is becoming more and more tied to SNS. Uh, right, recently, yes. already the uh, panorama images, like a, a very basic VR virtual reality output. So as VR and AR are becoming available uh, in the web browsers of smartphones, uh, more people can be viewing and communicating about invisible information and what the future will look at in the more immersive environment uh, than the photos posted today. So you showed some example city AR and uh, and so on in the summer art exhibitions. So yeah. in other words, I feel XR will lead the democratization, democratization, democracy. Right. So what do you think uh, of this trend? Uh, is there anything we should be aware of? Well, um, it's interesting because. Uh, what you see in social media can be also very uh, controlled and influenced. And we see of how, for example, Trump used social media to generate certain messages and certain opinions. Mm -hmm. But what I think the interesting part is that the digital tools and instruments become now so sophisticated that people actually can take part in what is happening around in their environment. So design tools become very simple and in a way that it allows anybody to engage in that. Uh, elements, big data and around that big uh, data information becomes available and visualization of data becomes available so that lay people can make decisions around what is their personal impact or what is an impact around in the city. And that really changes and drives behavior. So uh, the idea that I can uh, drive now with my bicycle versus drive with my car, and I realize that that has a certain impact on the city and how that, how much time I use, how much money I use. So suddenly I get very different information around it. But I would go even a step further that Bitcoin or the idea of an electronic uh, uh, currency allows actually not only for currency in terms of making money, but you can now attach value to things which now don't have a value. Meaning if I use the city in a certain way, so let's say I walk this way, I get currency, a fraction of currency uh, um, into my account. So suddenly I behave, I, I practice a good behavior because I'm rewarded through a digital currency. And that's one little thing doesn't cost much, but in the, in the collection, it will make a difference. So right now, social media is free and the company makes money. But if we turn it around and say, me as a person who puts information into social media, I get the money and the revenue by that, I suddenly interact with social media differently and I act more responsible of how I uh, engage within the city. Mm. Mm. And that becomes actually the interesting driver of things. So right now, social media is a passive one-way thing I'm consuming. I put something, I consume most of the others, but uh, there is no value for me other than just seeing but how can we attach the value and how can attach that value from the social media then to the design, the architecture in which we are. And I think that that will be the, the new development coming up. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So does anyone additional comments or the opposite comments from Rudy or Peter? Well, I would like to ask Rudy, um, this idea of the, your data generating income and money because uh, you try to own your own data in the future is of course interesting in Singapore, who is making money from the data? Is it not the state as a place, um, not the individual, but the, the society as whole? That's a good question. Um... The data we work with um, is, of course, almost all owned by the government. Um, but it's owned by different government agencies, depending on the domain that they are working on. So whether it's about you know, urban uh, design or about buildings or about 
transport. And um, the interesting thing is that there is not, although they work on it, there is not really a good exchange and integration of these data among the different um, mm. agencies. There is a, you know, this feeling of it's our data and we don't really want to share it. Um, you know, somebody might, even though it's all part of the same um, government. So I think that there is, these are issues that you um, quite, you know, accurately state is, um, and, and it, this goes beyond what we can do, but data integration, of course, should also um, include the ability for um, there to be certain, um, what is it, locks or, I mean, that you can share data under certain uh, circumstances, whether it costs money or whether it's only for a certain parts, but all the data should be able to be accessible centrally. And then the author should be able to identify which data can be publicly shared, which data can only be shared within a certain uh, network, which data can be used for certain purposes, but not actually be copied, et cetera. I think there's a um, definitely a lot uh, of opportunity and possibility in, uh, in terms of law, in terms of uh, security, um, et cetera, to, to work on this. But yes, even in Singapore, this is a, um, a very major issue. Yes, uh, because I think I saw maps of Singapore where you can go into nowadays um, public parks. Uh, how crowded are they? At what time? What, what malls are um, frequent? At which time? By how many people? And you even have maps of where is um, COVID positive people running around so I can avoid them because I see on the map, there's like three in the street next door. So I'd be careful and uh, which is interesting. How do they get, um, how do they manage to, to track every positive person? Yeah, well, that of course is a, is a consequence of um, COVID and the pandemic. And um, this is, um, it, it is an issue um, to me um, you know, where do you draw the line of um, privacy? Um, basically, in order for us to move forward and relax rules um, even more, it is required for everybody to, um, whenever they are outside, let's say going to malls, going to uh, movie theaters, anywhere where it's a public space um, indoor, to have a, either a token or your mobile phone with you, which will collect um, data on where you are um, constantly. And this is how they are able um, to do that. And at least 70% of the population will have to be able to use this before we move to what we call phase three, um, which is the last step before the new normal. Mm. Okay, may I ask a question to Ludi uh, regarding your presentation? So you present it the first stage is a virtual Singapore project. Uh, it's become or uh, it's become running the uh, de facto standard project in the Singapore for 3D digitalizations. So I'm question, have a question: Was there any movement? Uh, in agree with uh, general opinion, but uh, disagree with uh, each argument. Uh, in other words, uh, people are in favor of the concept of creating a virtual Singapore, but uh, do not want to provide their own housing data because they want to keep it confidential, it's a privacy. So this happens a lot in Japan, Japan mm -hmm. project. So how did the project execute a reach a consensus on the project and how did you proceed mm -hmm. to, to growing up the project, Budget Singapore project? If you know, please let me know. Well, the, the virtual Singapore project initially is uh, purely based on um, 
LIDAR data and um, photographs taken, which of course uh, the government can do freely take uh, pictures from the planes or from the cars uh, everywhere. Um, and with that built a, a 3D um, geometric model and then uh, take the pictures and glue them basically onto the model in order to create this visually um, attractive model. But you're right, I mean, in order to make this project really um, useful, more has to happen. So we've been um, working only with government agencies um, to get these um, BIM models. And even then, we had a lot of difficulty collecting these BIM models because you're right. Developers are not very eager to share these models. Um, and government agencies, even though they own the buildings in a way to a large extent, or they have to review, um, they have to check these design models for their um, yeah, ability to be built, they don't, cannot, or do not want to require the, uh, the, the, those who, who create the models to actually share these models other than for the limited purposes that they are um, required to. So we had a lot of difficulty getting um, lots of BIM models. And, um, but to me, I mean, the, the government of course, isn't necessarily eager to share the model per se, but is eager to create applications that use this data. And one that I can think of is when you go onto, or when I go onto a, um, a real estate website and I look for a new apartment and I look at the pictures that are um, available of that apartment or of that building, they all look, you know, quite good. Because of course, you know, the pictures that they take from, let's say, you know, often there are no images from the window taken. So whether there's a blank wall, a meter from your window is not available until you actually are able to go and visit the place. If you have such a 3D model, it would help immensely to get a better understanding of, you know, before you actually start visiting um, apartments to get a better understanding of which one you might like or um, not like. I think there's a still a lot of work in order. You're absolutely right. Um, the, of course, a lot more here is owned by the government, I think, in Singapore than in Japan. And so they can um, overcome some of these obstacles, but at the same time, they may not be willing. And I give one example. I said that um, BIM submission is not required yet in Singapore in the IFC mm. format. Mm. Now, they've been talking about that for years. And um, it's very easy. You just have to write a law that for buildings larger than a certain size, you have to provide an IFC model. Mm -hmm. But the, the companies, the offices, etc., that produce these building designs, they would immediately start complaining it's going to cost us a lot more money to produce these IFC models because a lot of offices don't use BIM to that extent yet. And so mm. the government is very um, concerned in a way. I mean, they don't want to impose. They are able to, in a, in a way that is probably much easier to be done than in Europe, to impose new rules. But they are at the same time very pragmatic about what they can do and what might, if, if there should be, would be a huge backlash. Mm. That would be, um, yeah, they would want to avoid that at all costs. Oh. Yeah, thank you. My understanding is uh, the Virtual Singapore project is not uh, just a photogrammetry 3D modeling like a Google Earth. 
So uh, the it's con consists of the BIM models. It's very yeah high qualities, high much informations than just a photogrammetry modeling. So well, the benefit it, and the disadvantage is uh, should be balanced. It is like, meant like, to be, but this is a, still a long process in the in the making. Mm, I see. And also, do you have any idea to the native beam? and uh, I have C and uh, city GML uh, will continue to be upgraded yes. year by year, day, day, day by day, year by year. Yes. On the other hand, it will be necessary to manage uh, outdated data and update uh, semantic information. So what is the strategy for the, this issue in the virtual Singapore project? Do you have any strategies, scheme to manage the data? Um. Well, we, we've been discussing this with the um, agencies. Let's say, for example, the agencies that um, check compliance of um, BIM models, they um, keep the, the original BIM models. Mm -hmm. They might convert them into IFC for certain purposes, but they will never store the IFC models because they are very worried that some data might be lost and so that they don't have access to the original data. Even though a BIM model, if it's a Revit model for a large building, it's much harder to work with. Um, huge Revit, uh, I mean, a Revit model of a huge building or a huge complex of buildings often is subdivided into, into smaller models because it's impossible to keep everything in one. So there are a lot of downsides. Um, also the fact that of course, a native BIM format changes much quicker than an IFC format or a CTGML format. So that's why what we suggested to them was to say half let's say whether it's a CTGML or an, a BIM model, of course, depends on what kind of use cases but lock into this model the, for example, the unique identifiers so that you can always link back to the original data for particular purposes. But keep in mind that this original data is not in five years time, you might not be able to access it anymore because you know, the software has changed and I don't think they are this, they are not really thinking um, long term with respect to, to that level. In fact, they have the same problem, of course, with the virtual Singapore model, is that this model is, I think, already close to five or seven years old. Lots has changed. How do you update this model? I think what they will do is what they're planning to do is do the whole process again, collect all the images and the LIDAR data again, start from scratch, build a whole new model. Whereas we should actually build in the whole plot process of, of construction of building maintenance to make sure that this data is always updated. Just think of fire safety, for example. Mm. If there is a virtual Singapore model, there's a fire somewhere and the fire department is able to find exactly, you know, the floor plan or the plan of the building to know where to go to, what to do, what is, you know, dangerous, etc. This would be incredibly helpful, but yes, this requires a lot of management and a lot of aspects. Okay, thank you. Uh Peter or the Max, uh, do you have any additional comments uh, regarding this issue? No? Okay. Yes, I, I, oh, no, I okay, have a please. quick question. Do you think there could be a different incentive generated? So saying that the data, you know, that there is obviously value, they don't want to give that, but they say, well, if I give it out, I actually earn money, right? So that there is a different finance structure and incentive that the data which can have generated is shared. Yeah. There is definitely that incentive. They are doing it for um, certain um, sets of data. 
Um, now, also more data is being um, shared publicly, although not necessarily fully integrated. Um, but I think it requires still a lot of um, top-down um, decision-making on you know, getting everybody's head in the same direction and creating um, means to make more value of this data. But you're absolutely right. OK, yeah. I think that would be actually very good to have that because it allows actually also a new economy that people actually do the models and incentivize them differently, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Naomi, do you have any yeah. questions to present? Oh, yes, Mark. Um, uh, you showed us um, VR urban design engagement and virtual tea. And yeah. so, um, um, do you think the architecture tools uh, will become so simplified and advanced? And it might be uh, used robotically or something. And uh, um, my concern is the eliminating the need for an architect. So, what do you f do you think of the profession of the uh, as an architect? Right. Hmm. Um, Yes, the tools will become so sophisticated and simple that people be able to design their own environment, their own apartment, their building and so on. At the same time, they can quantify what it costs and they can know, you know, whether they can do changes in 10 years time, they can all able and very simple to project. Now, sure, the role of the architect, but the role of the architect is always changing how the architect worked 10 or 100 years ago is different from now and it will be different in, in another 10 years. I think the, the architect is still very much the facilitator, the narrative, developing the narrative and be able to bring together different sets of expertise, of interest and so on. So if I can now design by myself a house or a building, that is, I will do that from my own point of view, what I want to do. However, I'm not necessarily will then consider the environment, my neighbor, the city and all these kind of things. So this is where you as an architect can come in and say, I understand your personal interest, but in the context of the city, we have to do other things. In the context of being carbon neutral, I can allow you, you maybe use a certain software, a certain tool, which generates an outcome, but is that really the best outcome, which is what you want? Mm -hmm. And by that, you go to the to the to an expert who helps you to develop the different narrative and to develop a different outcome. You could say, similar like a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. In lockdown, we couldn't go to a hairdresser, we cut our own hair. Mm -hmm. And we watch video and we see how it goes, and it looks okay. <laughs> but now the hairdresser is available. We go to hairdresser because it makes it better. It makes it nice. And it gives us a different feel. So if, if I can go to professional, I, it takes away the responsibility that I now, do I do it really right or not? And I think this is where really the architect can go. They, they actually offer a service. They can offer something which we want and which gives us in this dialogue uh, that we come actually to the right outcome. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, maybe Mark, um, what you're talking about was something like the configuration of your car on the website of a car maker, where you configure the engine, uh, the color, and all these things, all, and then the company produces the project. It might possibly be that we will do that in the future, and we will not talk about single freestanding homes but we will talk maybe about the apartment within a, a bigger a bigger block, a bigger concept. Yes. And then the uh, you will configure possibly your piece in there. Uh, and the bigger, larger picture, somebody else will do all the construction. And maybe if you move somewhere else, you will configure that interior um, and then people will help you there. So you don't have to do all these things yourself, but 
the architects will possibly somebody be somebody that will be a consulting person, either in the process of uh, talking as an agent with the, yep. uh, the, the users or the clients or talking and being on the side of the producer of complicated things. Yes. Uh, so this could be quite interesting and I'm not so 100% sure seeing from the VR models that everybody wants to go in there and produce VR models unless it's super easy, which TikTok is showing, for example, that how easy it is to do VR uh, for your hair or uh, applying princess stuff and so on. Uh, the, the Actually, the intelligence, the AI is pretty good in these things and it's being used, of course, for different purposes, but everybody's using it. And um, I think the AI they are developing in these things is pretty interesting. Yeah. Although the usage is maybe weird, but um, yeah. the technology is quite intense. It's very intense and it allows for very different engagement. It allows for different discussions. And, and I think this is, this is actually where an architect can really embrace it and not say, oh, I, they now know about things and you know, how, where's my job? I think you can guide the conversation. You can actually embrace it for, for and be on the front foot and say, there's this new ways to, to engage in it. Let's help and engage together. And by that come to the right outcome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, may yeah. I ask a question? Maybe it's the last topics. Uh, uh, this this topic maybe sound a little bit personal, uh, but for example, I asked to all of you, and for example, uh, Mark uh, taught and living in Hong Kong, Sydney, and Wellington now. So uh, real life experience across multiple countries and cities, not just a mm -hmm. tourism. It's invaluable. What will happen in a post-pandemic? Uh, will people get to move around in the world like before? Or will there be more and more online meeting like today's symposium? Staying in the country or city where you live? If in the latter case, we are curious about how people can accumulate valuable real world experiences like ones you accumulate in the future. And whether they can be assisted by VR and the advanced information technologies. So I'm asking you that your future uh, view of after right, yes. post-pandemic regarding the living and the architecture and the buildings. Right, uh, yes. Because um, today's audience uh, involved in the many students uh, in Japan. So right. uh, okay, as good. Peter yes. says, uh, many students will continue to live in the 22 centuries that yes. Peter said. Yeah, so please yes. uh, give a message to the young people, generations. Yes, um, <laughs> the, the online and so on the world, we all still have our own time zones, right? For me, it's already very late in the evening. So this is something where you reach a limit how much you can actually work together online or experience things uh, without being there. Uh, so th this will be by that certain travel will, will happen because you can't work all the time in, in different time zones. Um, it comes back to the social experience and the personal thing. There is an incredible value by meeting each other face to face, have the, the real environment, have the, the local food, have the local thing, and have actually the, the not topic relevant uh, discussion. So right now in our Zoom, we only talk about what this the seminar is about. We not talk about the weather, about whether I feel good and all the things. These elements are very important in a social context. And that is really only in the face-to-face. -face. I don't think that uh, a virtual media can actually facilitate that. Yeah. 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 Yes, I would like to uh, yeah, say something. Please, Peter. Well, <clears throat> this is 2020 now. And in the year 2001, I was in Japan with an exhibition and Naomi I met Naomi in 2001 in Tokyo because she uh, invited us over for an exhibition I did. Um, and I was three or four days in Tokyo and we met and she was very hospitable and 
so we became friends. And as you see, 19 years later, here I am uh, uh, now virtually. But of course, it would have been totally different if we all would have met now in Tokyo today in real life. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't stay for 10 hours only in Tokyo. So we would see things, we would eat new things, we would get to know each other. And uh, Mark and Rudy and, and you, Mr. Fukuda. And so we would, you know, maybe develop into friends. And so, as you see, the world is different if you go there. And now what Mark was saying, we're having the net, the net conference with the, uh, with, the, with the net content being brought about, but all the one that makes it surplus is missing. So I don't think you can do, you can really go into virtual with that. And if you don't travel and meet other people uh, for students, that this is not the way to do it. So go out there when you can again. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the question is, you, you could say the question is how, how far do you go out and how far do you have to go out? There is always a thing in the one-to-one -one is a real thing. Do I have to travel 10 times around the world? No. To be a good architect, you be understand very local and the local context and the country which you are in. And you want to understand what's gone out from, from outside there. Uh, if you have the opportunity, yes, but one has to really consider what is the what is the carbon footprint which I develop through this travel? And can I do something that is sustainable? And is it really needed in this context? And looking very specifically at you know, these kind of conferences, um, until a year or two ago, all conferences were physical conferences. You know, we didn't have any experience with this. And suddenly, all conferences had to become virtual. And now, I, my hope would be that we can move towards hybrid conferences. Because obviously, we still need the physical ability to meet it's as mark and and peter have said but there are a lot of people who cannot attend the conference who you know they might be students they might be at the on the other side of the world they um you know don't have the funds together and they're basically excluded and in a in a virtual environment like this suddenly you know they are able to at least get a taste of what what is his ability then they can decide whether next time maybe you know they collect their funds or they they do whatever is necessary to be able to travel there to fly there but that would be you know my hope for um the future and i it's you know it might be very difficult we don't have much experience with it um but in any way that we could develop hybrid ways of meeting with people it would give a lot more flexibility to everybody to decide whether for them that particular travel is important or whether they would like to join in a virtual way. Yeah. Okay. Well, well said closing remarks from Mark, from Rudy there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so any questions or comments from the audience? We have, we close to the uh, closing remarks. <clears throat> okay, uh, after the round table discussion, we move to the uh, networking place. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, some keynotes uh, participate the networking place. So please discuss more deeply. So, okay, uh, no question, okay. Thank you for the discussion in the timing coming. And uh, so the, we, we, should, we should be the end now. And then uh, we will continue to take a group photo session uh, on the, this online. So uh, all the presenters and the audiences, uh, please turn on your webcams and uh, take pictures, uh, screenshot by yourself <laughs> at your leisure. I call on the uh, please shot. Anyway, but uh, anyway, please turn on the your webcams, and you can 
uh, arranged by yourself uh, so how to display uh, your own view, a speaker view or a gallery view and so on. I recommend a gallery view, but uh, at maximum, uh, only 20 persons in a screen, one display. So I check, uh, let me check, uh, we can shift uh, by pushing the arrows, uh, we shift uh, four displays at all, four displays at all. <laughs> so uh, please, uh, anyway, please turn on your web camera. And after I call, uh, how I can say, <laughs> I forget. <laughs> so you can also rearrange it. You can uh, click an image and drag it uh, somewhere else. A camera. Oh image, yeah, yeah, If you yeah, want yeah. to rearrange, if you want okay. to have a different neighbor. Okay, 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 uh, okay. <laughs> Take a shot. Uh, Professor Tani Sensei is okay. Right now is okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Please shot. Okay, shot. Anyway, uh, raise a hand. Please screen shot. Oh, my 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 camera is not available. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, anyway, screenshot, please, for keeping the raise a hand. Okay. And shift to the next. Oh. Oh. <laughs> next. And also uh, shoot from the after using the smartphone. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So the last one that we keep one uh, 30 seconds. Oh, I, I got that some more chat. Oh. Okay, is enough? Satisfy? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we finish the, this uh, keynote session uh, and a uh, uh, good presentation at all. Thank you very much. And uh, please uh, mute off and uh, get applause to the keynote presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.